Hey guys, it's Mrs. Austin, and this is part three in our reading of The One and Only Ivan. Again, it's a 3.6, so here we go. If you remember, at the last time we read, we'd learned about Ivan, we'd learned about where he lives there at the mall. Last time we learned a little bit about Stella the elephant and also about Bob the dog. And when we left him, there were two children that had spit at him and another one that had thrown pebbles. So he called them the spit children, and he referred to them as slimy chimps, which is not a very nice word for him, okay, to say. All right, Julia is where we're at. Like the spit pebble children, Julia is a child, but that, after all, is not her fault. While her father, George, cleans the mall each night, Julia sits by my domain. She could sit anywhere she wants by the carousel, in the empty food court, on the bleachers coated in sawdust. But I'm not bragging when I say that she always chooses to sit with me. I think it's because we both love to draw. Sarah, Julia's mother, used to help clean them all. But when she got sick and grew pale and stooped, Sarah stopped coming. Every night, Julia offers to help George, and every night he firmly says, Homework, Julia. The floors will just get dirty again. Homework, I've discovered, involves a sharp pencil and thick books and long sighs. <sighs> like that. I enjoy chewing pencils. I am sure I would excel at homework. Sometimes Julia dozes off and sometimes she reads her books, but mostly she draws pictures and talks about her day. I don't know why people talk to me, but they often do. Perhaps it's because they think I can't understand them. Or perhaps it's because I can't talk back. Julia likes science and art. She doesn't like Lila Burpee, who teases her because her clothes are old. And she does like Deshaun Williams, who teases her too, but in a nice way. And she would like to be a famous artist when she grows up. Sometimes Julia draws me. I am an elegant fellow in her pictures, with my silver back gleaming like moon on moss. I never look angry, the way I do on the fading billboard on the highway. I always look a little bit sad, though. Drawing Bob. I love Julia's pictures of Bob. She draws him flying across the page, a blur of feet and fur. She draws him motionless, peeking out from behind a trash can or the soft hill of my belly. Sometimes in her drawings, Julia gives Bob's wings or a lion's mane. Once she gave him a tortoise shell. But the best thing she ever gave him wasn't a drawing. Julia gave Bob his name. For a long time, no one knew what to call Bob. Now and then, a mall worker would try and approach him with a tidbit. Here, Dougie, they'd call, holding out a french fry. Come on, pooch, they'd say. How about a little bit of sandwich? But he would always vanish into the shadows before anyone could get too close. One afternoon, Julia decided to draw the little dog curled up in the corner of my domain. First, she watched him for a long time, chewing on her thumbnail. I could tell she was looking at him the way an artist looks at the world when she's trying to understand it. Finally, she grabbed her pencil and set to work. When she was finished, finished, she held up the page. There he was, the tiny big-eared dog. He was smart and cunning, but his gaze was wistful. Under the picture were three bold, confident marks, circled in black. I was pretty sure it was a word, even though I couldn't read it. Julia's father peered over her shoulder. That's him exactly, he said, nodding. He pointed to the circled marks. I didn't realize his name was Bob, he said. Me either, she smiled. I had to draw him first. Bob and Julia. Bob will not let humans touch him. He says their scent upsets his digestion. But every now and then, I see him sitting at Julia's feet. Her fingers move gently, just behind his right ear. Mac. Usually Mac leaves after the last show, but tonight he's in his office working late. When he's done, he stops by my domain and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. George joins him, broom in hand, and Mac says the thing he always says. How about that game last night? And business has been slow, but it'll get better, you'll see. And don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over at the picture Julia is drawing. What are you making? He asks. It's for my mom, Julia says. It's a flying dog. She holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes and dogs. Hmm, Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing, anyway? About the same, George says. 
She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Max says. Max starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Max says with a shrug, buy the kids some more crayons. Mac is already out the door before George can yell, thanks. Not sleepy. Stella, I say after Julia and her father go home, I can't sleep. Of course you can, she said. You are the king of sleepers. Shh, Bob says from the perch on my belly. I'm dreaming about chili fries. I'm tired, I say, but I'm not sleepy. What are you tired of? Stella asks. I think for a while. It's hard to put into words. Gorillas are not complainers. We are dreamers, poets, philosophers, nap takers. I don't know exactly. I kick at my tire swing. I think I may be a little bit tired of my domain. That's because it's a cage, Bob tells me. Bob is not always tactful. I know, Stella says, it's a very small domain. And you're a very big gorilla, Bob adds. Stella, I ask, yes. I noticed you were limping more than usual today. Is your leg bothering you? Just a little, Stella answers. I sigh. Bob resettles, his ears flick, and he drools a bit, but I don't mind. I'm used to it. Try eating something, Stella says. That always makes you happy. I eat an old brown carrot. It doesn't help, but I don't tell Stella. She needs to sleep. You could try remembering a good day, Stella suggests. That's what I do when I can't sleep. Stella remembers every moment since she was born, every scent, every sunset, every slight, and every victory. You know I can't remember much, I say. There's a difference, Stella says gently, between can't remember and won't remember. That's true, I admit. Not remembering can be difficult, but I've had a lot of time to work on it. Memories are precious, Stella adds. They help tell us who we are. Try remembering all your keepers. You always like Carl, the one with the harmonica. Carl, yes. I remember how he gave me a coconut when I was still a juvenile. It took me all day to open it. I tried to recall the other keepers I've known. The humans who cleaned my domain and prepared my food and sometimes kept me company. There was Juan, who poured Pepsi into my winning mouth, and Katrina, who used to poke me with a broom while I was sleeping, and Ellen, who sang, How much is that monkey in the window? with a sad smile while she scrubbed my water bowl. And there was Gerald, who once bought, brought me a box of fat, sweet strawberries. Gerald was my favorite keeper. I haven't had a real keeper in a long time. Max says he doesn't have the money to pay for an ape babysitter. These days, George cleans my cage and Mac is the one who feeds me. When I think about all the people who have taken care of me, mostly it's Mac, I recall, day in and day out, year after year. Mac who bought me and raised me and says I'm no longer cute. As if a silverback could ever be cute. Moonlight falls on the frozen carousel, on the silent popcorn stand, on the stall of leather belts that smell like long gone cows. The heavy work of Stella's breathing sounds like the wind in the trees, and I wait for sleep to find me. The Beetle Mac gives me a new black crayon and a fresh pile of paper. It's time to get to work again. I smell the crayon. I roll it in my hands, press the sharp point against my palm. There's nothing I love more than a new crayon. I search my domain for something to draw. What is black? An old banana peel would work, but I've eaten them all. Not tag is brown. My little pool is blue. The yogurt raisin I'm saving for this afternoon is white, at least on the outside. Something moves in the corner. I have a visitor. A shiny beetle has stopped by. Bugs often wander through my domain on their way to somewhere else. Hello, beetle, I say. He freezes, silent. Bugs never want to chat. The beetle's an attractive bug with a body like a glassy nut. He's black as a starless night. That's it, I'll draw him. It's hard making a picture of something new. I don't get the chance that often, but I try. I look at the beetle, who's being kind enough to not move, and then back at my paper. I draw his body, his legs, his little antennae, his sour expression. I'm lucky, the beetle stays all day. Usually bugs don't linger when they visit. I'm beginning to wonder if he's feeling all right. Bob, 
who's known too much, <laughs> Bob, who's been known to munch on bugs from time to time, offers to eat him. I tell Bob that won't be necessary. I'm just finishing my last picture when Mac returns. George and Julia are with him. Mac enters my domain and picks up a drawing. What the heck is this? He asks. Beats me what Ivan thinks he's drawing. This is a picture of nothing, a big black nothing. Julia is standing just outside my domain. Can I see? She asks. Mac holds my picture up to the window. Julia tilts her head. She squeezes one eye. Then she opens her eye and scans my domain. I know, she says, it's a beetle. See that beetle over there by Ivan's pool? Man, I just sprayed this place for bugs. Mac walks over to the beetle and lifts his foot. Before Max can stomp, the beetle skitters away, disappearing through a crack in the wall. Mac turns back to the drawings. So you figure this is a beetle, huh? If you say so, kid. Oh, that's a beetle for sure, Julia says. I know a beetle when I see one. It's nice, I think, having a fellow artist around. And that is where we are going to stop because a big change is coming to Mac and his friends there in the mall. We will read all about it tomorrow. Bye, guys.